Let's pray. Heavenly Father, send us out with a joyful heart in Jesus' name. Amen. So only God is holy. Now, people like to pretend they're holy, but even on our best days, right after we have done something that really even amazed us, a few minutes later, the light and fire go out and the darkness finds its way back into our hearts and soul. If you have not read the story of Elijah and uh, the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings 18, it's as good an example as any. 450 prophets of Baal challenged the one Elijah to a contest. First one to light the sacrificial fire wins all the marbles. Now, try as they might, the prophets can't get so much as a spark, which allows the prophet Elijah to turn and say, perhaps your God is in the bathroom. When they finally give up, Elijah barely has time to say a quick prayer. Jumps back, fire falls from heaven, consumes the wood, the sacrifice, oh, and the thousands of gallons of water that Elijah had poured on the wood just to make a point. You would think after this amazing moment of holiness that it couldn't get any better for Elijah. But Queen Jezebel, well, she yells at him, and Elijah just literally has had enough. He runs off to a cave, tell God it's not worth living, and that there's nobody left but him. You know, for something to be holy, it has to be wrapped in the holiness of God. Whether it is the ground that Moses is standing on, the angels uh, singing their praises in heaven, the temple that Solomon built, or a young girl that God chooses to bring a tiny baby into the world in a place called Bethlehem. When God wraps his holiness around something, it becomes holy. Most of the holy places I know of are not churches. They don't have pulpits or lecterns or pastor's offices or baptismal fonts. Nope, they are classrooms, living rooms, garages, offices, playgrounds, backyards. The moment you set foot in them, you know that you have found God at work. For reasons known only to God, it is these places he chooses to make himself known through teachers, moms, dads, neighbors, friends, even the mechanic, a crusty old mechanic that actually did a few extra things on your car without charging you because he watched you juggling your kids as you were waiting for the car and he remembered his own kids and he decided that maybe you could use some help the way that Somebody helped him a long time ago. You know, most pastors, when we preach our first sermon to real people, instead of just the dog, we tend to do one of two things. We either preach way too long or we preach way too short. But the one connecting point between both of those is that nobody has a clue what we are saying. On the way out of church, everyone still says, great sermon. But when they get to the car, they turn to one another and say, got any idea what he was trying to say? Jesus' first sermon, on the other hand, at least the first one recorded in the Bible, whole different matter. He reads the scripture lesson from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he said, well, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, and he hands the scroll back and sits down. Shortest sermon ever. But everybody got it. Jesus wasn't just reading what Isaiah wrote. Jesus was telling them he was the one Isaiah wrote about. I want you to think about what Jesus said. You now have everything you need because I'm here. How does that sit with you? You have everything you need because I am here. You know, even the most hardened atheist and evolutionist spend their life trying to figure out the meaning of life. There has to be more than just a mere existence, doesn't there? Artists, musicians, scientists, authors, poets, dreamers, they stare into the vastness of space, trying to see something that no one else has ever seen before. The one thing that makes sense of everything and ties it all together in this beautiful package. Albert Einstein Einstein spent the last 30 years of his life trying to develop a unified theory of everything. He was looking for the one thing, tied it all together, that just put this beautiful bow on it and just everybody said, now everything makes sense. He never found it. One of his most inspired quotes, at least I think, 
Theory is when you know everything and nothing works. Practice is when everything works and nobody knows why. Here we have brought together theory and practice. Nothing works and no one knows why. You see, that's one of the problems of studying science without God. Humanity is a part of something far bigger than itself. When I remind you that you are a unique and unreproducible and often peculiar miracle of God, what I want you to know and feel is your connection to everything. You aren't an accident. The world literally cannot exist without you. And if it has to exist without you, it's not going to be the same. God created you. He gifted you to the world and he gifted the world to you. And there was, in the original design, supposed to be this symbiotic relationship where all things work together for good. Sin tore this apart. And before we make it sound like, you know, sin just came from the outside and it's some outside force that we have no control over and one day it just popped in and ruined everything, it, it's a lot more personal than that. There's a story of G.K. Chesterton. He was an amazing theologian and pastor who lived in London in the 1900s. When the London Times asked an open-ended editorial question, what is wrong with the world? Pastor G.K. is supposedly have written back to them, dear sirs, I am. It's interesting when Jesus told his disciples, I want you to heal the sick and raise the dead, cleanse those with skin diseases, drive out demons. None of that was about saving anyone's soul. No sinner's prayer, no notches in your Bible for all those miserable sinners that you led to Jesus. But Jesus sends out his disciples to heal a very, very broken world. Interesting. I was working with a group of people. We were chosen according to our gifts and skill, thrown into a room to accomplish a specific task. We were moving along fairly well when a single individual brought everything to a screeching halt. We tried to find a workaround to his objection, but he remained very steadfast in his no, no, no. His objections were real. We got it, but we were not tasked with just giving up. We were tasked with finding solutions. The debate went on for quite a while. The chair finally said, you know what, you guys need a break. Everybody take 10 or 15 minutes. I was out in the hallway, and it was way too early for anybody back home to be awake, and so I didn't have any emails, so I was just kind of standing there when this individual, uh, the obstinate one, came over. We started talking, but we weren't talking about anything that we were working on. We were just chatting about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and Hawaii, and where he's from, and that's when it happened. You see, in the course of the conversation, just as casual as could be, no, no clenched fists, no, no tears, he simply said, well, you know, nine months ago when my wife died, and there it was, now I understood all of his no's. He was in pain. Suffering is a part of the human experience. And when we are in pain, it changes how we see ourselves. It changes how we see others. It changes how we see the world. The level of pain determines the impact it has on our life and the lives of those around us. And until we deal with our pain, it's going to keep us from our life, our love, and everything else. Suffering and pain cannot be explained or compared. Even if you've been through the exact same thing, it's different because you are different. I am terrible at helping people with their pain, just as I am often very terrible at trying to help myself with my own pain and suffering. Suffering is a time to be still and know that he is God, and few of us have the patience for such things. And so we rush to comfort the other person so that we can move on. Key word there is we, meaning us, not them. Them. Our rushing is less about helping them and more about lessening our own discomfort. Suffering is something the Apostle Paul, King David, and Solomon understood well. If their inspired writings or any indication of their life, how often do you suppose that they cried out to God without a pen in their hand? It's obvious that they are not only familiar with suffering, but they know it intimately. King David cried out, Lord, how long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long will I store up anxious concerns within me, agony within me every day? Solomon declared, meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. And St. Paul wrote, 
Three times I was beaten with rods by the Romans. Once I was stoned by my enemies. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and day in the open sea. On frequent journeys I faced dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the open country, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brothers, labor and hardship, many sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, often without food, cold and lacking clothing, not to mention that there is this daily pressure on me, my care for all of my churches. So why would King David, Solomon, and St. Paul keep going? If the pain is really that bad, suffering that intense, why? Like Elijah, wouldn't it just be easier to find a cave, crawl in it, and tell God that it's not worth living anymore? The ability to push through pain and suffering is usually less about our pain tolerance and more about us having something to live for, someone to love for. It is knowing there will be an end to the pain and suffering. But often the hardest thing in the universe is to see that end. Jesus didn't heal everyone, nor did he even try. I need to say that. Jesus did not heal everyone, nor did he even try. He even told St. Paul, you know, my grace is sufficient, so um, get back to work. If Jesus had wanted to storm the gates and create a new world order, all he would have had to have done would have promised that if you get baptized, you will never, ever have pain, anxiety, or hurt anymore. They would have lined up. But instead, Jesus said, if you follow me, they will persecute you, and it's only going to increase your pain and suffering. When Jesus sent out his disciples, it was never about healing for the sake of healing. It was about teaching people to be good stewards of their pain, to be good stewards of their suffering. See, it's not God that causes the pain and suffering. That's the result of sin. But it is God who expects us to learn from it, to grow from it, to use it to discover who we are and why we are still here. He wants us to understand that there is more to life than just not being in suffering or pain any longer. Yeah, you see, the world is caught up in pain relief. But you know, walking around in a stupor or not feeling anything anymore, that's worse than pain and suffering because it sucks the life from you. Most of us are experienced at suffering, and yet we still live on. Some of us, like Jacob, do so with a pronounced limp. Some of us wind up crawling, still others unable to do anything except just lay where they're at and hold out their arms and say, Lord, have mercy. But live on we do because we know there is a reason and a purpose, even if we don't understand it or like it. Once upon a time and place, water flowed off your head and into a font in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You were sealed by the Holy Spirit. You were marked with the cross of Christ forever. The most important part of baptism is is the part that few of us like to talk about. You see, we were buried with Christ in baptism. We died at our baptism. We were dead as dead can be. And then Jesus brought us back to life. You have to get that to understand why pain and suffering are survivable. Our baptism and the cross frames suffering in a very different way. The cross promises the presence of God in our pain and suffering. It doesn't promise to take it away, at least not yet, but it promises that we will never have to go through it alone. And while the church points to heaven as the ultimate and final healing, it is not heaven that is our goal, nor can it be. You see, it can't be because heaven, as we think of it, is not enough. This is where we see the brilliance of Jesus sending his disciples out to heal. Heaven is not a place. At least it's not only a place. Heaven is the presence of God. And so our healing comes not from the robes, uh, the roads of gold or the gates of pearl or the angelic choirs or the eternal harp music, but from God himself. And once you wrap your soul around this, you understand you don't have to wait until you die in order to be healed because God is already with you and the healing process is already at work. When Jesus sent out the disciples, they thought he was finally getting around to restoring the kingdom of God. Pretty soon, no one would be sick or die or be in pain. Everything would just be heavenly, except the heaven they were seeking wasn't really heaven because a life without pain and suffering can be found without God. But if God's not there, it's not heaven. It wasn't until a few years later when the lame and the deaf and the blind and the bleeding and the dead and the crazy were standing at the foot of the cross watching Jesus die that they began to understand if God wasn't afraid of suffering, 
if God didn't avoid pain or death. Maybe there was more to it than they understood. Three days later, when they saw Jesus alive and well, although he did have a few extra holes in his body, they finally got it. The cross binds us to the hard work of love in the midst of suffering. Being loved by God, we find ourselves able to love God. And then we begin learning how to love ourselves and love our neighbor and even love our enemies. We become holy ground, holy feet, holy lips, holy hands, holy ears, through which God works. We are holy only because we are wrapped in the holiness of God. Our sin and pain and suffering and all the other things, well, they just keep leaking out of us. But God can even use our unholy leaks in order to help those in need. What God wants the world to know is that he is the source of healing. And we don't have to wait until we die in order to know a healing that gives us a reason to live until that day when we are finally healed and whole in his presence forever in heaven. In the secular world, suffering and pain are interruptions and detours. In the life of the Christian, they are instruments of peace and love because they draw us closer to God. St. Paul wrote these words to you. And I mean that. He actually wrote these words to you. He said, I am persuaded that not even death or life, angels or rulers, things present or things to come, hostile powers, height or depth, or anything else created will ever have the power to separate us from the love of God that we have in Christ Jesus our Lord. You are the holiest thing in the universe because God has wrapped himself around your heart and soul. And whether you are a teacher, sailor, accountant, pilot, mom, dad, grandparent, or student, God's going to use you as a source of healing. Wherever you go, you're going to take God with you. Whatever you do, God can work through you. You are a little taste of heaven, leaks and all for the world to experience. Instead of crawling into a cave and giving up, we stand at the entrance for all the world to see. And we give thanks to God for our whole life, even the pain and the suffering. And then we boldly step forth. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.